Our next speaker is um, Dr. Lindsay Pocket, uh, and she is uh, an assistant professor of radiation oncology at the Mas Medical Con uh, College of Wisconsin at, uh, in Milwaukee, VA Medical Center. She completed her radiation oncology residency training at Northwell Health Lake Success in New York, and she's currently uh, practicing in thoracic and thoracic and CNS oncology. Can you still hear me? Just my. Dr. Puckett has research interest in SBRT, toxicity of treatment, and palliative care, and she has spoken nationally and internationally on these topics. Dr. Puckett, please go ahead. Thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation today. Let's see here. All right. Um, so, as, as you mentioned, I'm from the Medical College of Wisconsin, and we've been using Synchrony for our Rad Exact for a few years now. Um, here are my disclosures and Accuray's disclaimers, largely just saying that I'm an independent physician and my views don't necessarily represent the company. Um, so today I'll just be talking a little bit about image guidance in general for lung SBRT or SABR, um, motion management and lung cancer treatment specifically, and then I'll uh, guide you through our clinical experience thus far. Um, so first off, uh, SBRT or SABR is first line treatment for inoperable stage one or stage two lung cancer. It's also frequently used for um, other malignancies which have either spread to the lung or lung cancer which is metastasized when there's a focal spot. Um, SBRT is convenient for many reasons treating um, as you can give a really high dose of radiation treatment to a small area with excellent conformality. That's especially important for these patients as um, many of them do have COPD or emphysema and some may already be on oxygen. So in essence, they're using all the lung that they have and so we want to spare as much as we can. One of the limitations um, in treating lung is that there is a lot of movement potentially of the tumor and especially in the lower lobes. Um, I have this illustrated on the slide, but you can see, you know, depending on where the gross tumor volume is, um, there will always be respiratory motion and somehow we have to account for that. And then lastly, there's that uncertainty margin too. So you can really end up with a much larger volume um, than what you would like to treat. As we've improved our imaging abilities, um, this has allowed us to get a little bit more tight on, for example, our PTV. Um, and you can see through the years on the left over there that as we've gotten to IMRT and IGRT, our margins do shrink. Um, however, lung specifically as a site, as you can see on the right, um, there's a large margin there that um, really uh, provides a challenge when we're treating these patients. So as our last speaker just alluded to, um, there's many ways to do this. Uh, one of them is DIBH. Interestingly, I've not used this uh, frequently for our lung patients. Most of them are not able to hold their breath for 20 seconds, at least in our population. Um, and so if, if they're not able to do it successfully, then it can really prolong the treatment time. Abdominal compression is another technique that many institutions will use. Um, and this is an external device that's placed over the abdomen. Um, it works for some patients very well. Um, for others, it can be uncomfortable. For obese patients, it may not be practical. And unfortunately, it doesn't always reduce the um, volume or the motion. Um, and occasionally, it can increase it. Um, the last one, which I think we use largely outside of the RAD exact, is respiratory gating. Um, so the idea here is if you capture 10 phases of breathing, that you treat on only two or three of those where the tumor is in a similar location. Um, this is very successful in limiting the volume, and it's one way to reduce your ITV substantially. Um, however, you're only treating on uh, 20 to 30 percent of the phases, so it really increases the treatment time, and many of these patients have trouble being on the table for that long. So um, what we've done is, is using our RAD exact, um, we've trialed the synchrony, so it's a novel approach to it. Instead of um, you know, having reduced ITV or something like that, uh, what the machine is actually able to do is with the jaws, as the tumor moves, the jaws move with it, it's dynamic jaws. So it's actually following it up and down as it goes. Um, so that allows you simply to go from your GTV to your PTV when you're creating volumes for this. 
Um, here's a few specifics. Um, one just to highlight is um, for, for lung, it, you can do this either with or without fiducials. Um, in our practice, we've largely done it without fiducials quite successfully. We did have one patient who had fiducials. Um, otherwise, these are up here for your information. Um, so what has our experience been at Medical College? Um, we're the first site to employ this globally, um, dating back to 2019. And um, thus far, we've done planning for 24 for lung. Um, 18 of these have been treated, um, as I mentioned, the majority without fiducials. Of note, we also use it at our center for our prostate patients who are treated with SBRT with fiducials. Um, so before we do any treatment, there's obviously physics QA, and these patients had 100% uh, uh, passing rate when we were doing our initial checks. And so I think it's probably best illustrated by some cases. Um, the first patient that we treated was a 45-year-old man who had um, metastatic colorectal cancer, was just isolated pulmonary metastases. Um, he had had a disease in the past and some resections too. So again, you want to be mindful of the lung and what, a, what position will they be in in the future? Will you be retreating the lung? Um, this one you can see there's um, moderate respiratory motion and we ultimately treated him with uh, 54 gray and three fractions. This is from our treatment planning. You can see delineated a GTV. Um, for, for each of these patients, and especially since this is a novel technology, we've been doing two plans, one that's a synchrony plan and one non-synchrony, again, to ensure the safety and if um, there's any difficulties with actual treatment that we have both available. Um, so for the non-synchrony plan, we add the ITV. For the synchrony plan, we do not. Um, and ultimately, that results in these PTVs. So you have a smaller PTV for the synchrony or the larger, including your ITV. I had a recent patient um, who you can see here has a very irregularly shaped tumor. Um, so we were curious if this would work and it, it was a great approach for her. Um, she had moderate COPD and was not on oxygen, but um, probably will be there in the near future, unfortunately. Um, and we treated her also with 54 and three. So anytime you're doing anything new or if um, you're, you want to double check, um, you want some proof of principle that what you plan to deliver is actually what you did deliver. So we've done this using a precise art technique. Um, on the top here, you can see the plan dose. This is what we did in our synchrony plan. Um, and on the bottom, this represents from fraction one, what did we actually deliver? Did it go where we wanted it to go? Um, you know, are they, are they lining up? And we've been very pleased to see that that is the case. Um, this shows, again, for that colorectal plan, um, their first, second, and third fraction, which were all well in line with what we intended to deliver. We have started to look at um, differences between these two plans. Um, this is from uh, several years ago with our um, initial patients. Um, and among all of them, you can see the PTV volumes were smaller whenever we had the non-synchrony plan or sorry, the synchrony plan had smaller PTV volumes. Um, max doses tended to be fairly similar, um, actually, between the two, slight difference here. Um, and lung parameters, again, we found differences and improvements in our lung, um, lung numbers for this among all our initial patients. So this was reported back in 2020's ASTRO, um, just with those initial patients. Um, now we've treated uh, a number more, and so I di did a little bit of a dive, and we'll be reporting on this in the near future. Uh, but we've treated people with a variety of age ranges from uh, 24 up to 91, and now we're out to about a year and a half of follow-up. So among those patients who have at least a year of follow-up, um, and those are our first six patients again, um, we had no safety issues um, whatsoever. All of these had local control and um, in, until or dating up till the time of death, there's one metastatic patient who has since succumbed to disease elsewhere, but um, no local recurrence. Um, and importantly, no grade three toxicities, um, either during or following the treatment. So in practice, we found it very successful to go straight from our GTV to our PTV for these patients. Um, it, 
patients tolerate it well. Um, it's nice because it doesn't necessarily prolong treatment times. Um, and in our initial patients, it's been safe and effective. Um, throughout this time, our treatment paradigms have evolved and will probably continue to evolve. Um, one thing that is important is you do need to have a discrete volume either with fiducials um, or if it's up against something like a chest wall, the algorithm has to be able to capture it as, as a volume. So um, this has helped shape who we're treating, but our, our overall population has been largely successful. Um, and once we reach our first 20 that have been treated, um, then we do plan to report on those um, so that others can find out a little bit more. And here's one picture from our uh, very first patient treated globally, um, both with the Accuray and our physics team who have been you know, really paramount in this whole process. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll take questions at the end. Thank you very much.